a stalwart of American law enforcement, in a nearly 40-year reign at the top, J. Edgar Hoover would single-handedly transform the FBI. Part of its founding in 1935 and directing it till his death in 1972, Hoover would be a modernizer with an iron fist, advancing fingerprinting and forensics whilst railing against crime. But there is another side to J. Edgar Hoover, a man who saw no place for women as agents, a man who wanted only white FBI agents, a man who created a national blacklist, a man to abuse power in the name of upholding the law, and a man who even found Albert Einstein suspicious. Welcome to History on Fleek. Today we examine the darkest secrets of J. Edgar Hoover. Many of Hoover's secrets are now public knowledge, though arguably the darkest lies in his relationship with Cosa Nostra. A couple of decades into heading the FBI, Hoover's rise in the Institute was paralleled by a rise on the other side of the tracks, organized crime. Come the 1950s, the mob was arguably at the height of its power in the United States, yet Hoover didn't exactly come charging after the force of corruption. What in retrospect seems a terrible prioritizing, Hoover's organization prioritized the Cold War threats of subversion and communism over any domestic organized crime. This may have partly been due to keeping face. Hoover had headed up the agency's famed taking down of John Dillinger and other famed prohibition gangsters and wished to keep the iconography alive. Moreover, Hoover may have been smart enough to realize organized crime couldn't be solved. Come 1950, the U.S. Senate's Kefauver Committee would unequivocally reveal the extent and damage of organized crime in the country. By the end of the decade, even Hoover's own agents submitted reports detailing much the same. So where was Hoover when it came to the mob? There is one school of thought on why the FBI's strongman director was cool on the mafia. Many to this day believe that the mob had damaging material on Hoover they were able to blackmail him with. It would align with other reports on Hoover's personal life that if he was a man living in hiding over his sexuality, nefarious parties could weaponize that against him. Many contended that it's not improbable the mob had compromat that would reveal Hoover as a member of the LGBTQ community. Heading up the FBI for 37 years, J. Edgar Hoover had near unprecedented power and surveillance. As it turns out, he really wasn't phased by this either. He somewhat relished in it. Following the 1950s anti-communist hysteria, the U.S. political scene would increasingly concern civil rights and anti-war movements across the following decade. As opposed to sensibilities towards these being movements for justice, human rights, and peace over violence and enmity, J. Edgar Hoover saw these as the most profound threats to America since, well, the Civil War. Hoover wanted no limits on his role, starting right back in the 1930s, essentially asking at the time President FDR for unlimited power. This was based on the perception that Russia was planting spies to steal America's nuclear and atomic weaponry classified information. It turned out Hoover's hunch was entirely correct, and for the following decades his tabs and files on people would be entrusted. In the decades that followed, Hoover's list of enemies to national security was wide-ranging and in part entirely based on suspicion. On permission of both President Kennedy and Attorney General Bobby Kennedy, Hoover bugged Martin Luther King Jr., convinced his advisor was communist. Hoover would wiretap, publicly oppose, and denounce Dr. King, becoming obsessed with the man's sex life. Even the Nobel Prize win would not turn Hoover, declaring him the most notorious liar in the country. Hoover made an enemy of public figures anywhere who should have any allegiance to a social cause. Along with Martin Luther King and publicly renowned figures like Albert Einstein, Hoover went after any music act that displayed any kind of stance or activism. After putting on a concert for an imprisoned activist and poet, John Sinclair, the FBI director made John Lennon a target. Yep, party pooper of the century, J. Edgar Hoover even made an enemy of the Beatles. Joking aside, John Lennon was rightfully scared of the FBI's attention on him. Hoover wanted him deported from the United States. Only the election of Jimmy Carter in 1976 would bring Lennon peace and permanent residency. Released files from the FBI would show just how much Hoover had campaigned against the rock star. He'd even issued wanted posters to local police departments. 
Amusingly, perhaps Hoover's archaic FBI wasn't hip with the times. The posters printed had a photo of somebody completely different. While J. Edgar Hoover's sexuality would be a source of gossip and slander throughout the 20th century, his hiring practices were far more scandalous. Putting it mildly, Hoover wasn't exactly an open-armed, inclusive character. Reportedly, when Hoover was appointed director of the Justice Department's Bureau of Investigation in 1924, the precursor to the FBI, only three of its special agents were women. Hoover soon requested that two of these three agents resign, and the third agent was out the door after an office transfer within three years. It's been written Hoover found women unpredictable in their nature and therefore not equipped to be special agents. Hoover could envisage women learning to use a gun, but apparently not battling it out with gangsters in a shootout. While clearly discriminatory, the irony of Hoover's shutting out women from federal agent status was their ever-growing presence in local law enforcement across the United States. Despite J. Edgar Hoover's archaic stance on his agents, women made up 30% of FBI employees in 1948. None of them agents, mind you, but nevertheless. As is evidenced in his treatment of public figures, the social movements of the 1960s and 70s were not exactly to the FBI director's taste. Along with refusing to make women special agents across these decades, he would also ixnay hiring any black agents as well even with Attorney General Bobby Kennedy ordering him to do so. The FBI would reverse these practices, but the changes would come after Hoover's passing in 1972. Some of J. Edgar Hoover's darkest secrets are more publicly known than others, though frankly, few are as underhanded as his role in the Lindbergh kidnapping. In a macabre twist and potentially a fallout from the economic quagmire of the Great Depression, America was struck with a spate of kidnappings across the 1930s. Typically, children were taken from the richest, wealthy families and ransom demands for up to hundreds of thousands of dollars were made. Sometimes the children were returned for ransom. Many times, they never returned and were soon found dead. The Lindbergh kidnapping of 1932 was without a doubt the kidnapping granted the most publicity. When the matter came to trial, many would refer to it as the trial of the century. Yet closer examination proves the FBI's role, and in particular, Hoover's work on the case was predominantly cosmetic. For the most part, Hoover was keen to make sure the image of a positive force for good that he tried to instill in the public image of the FBI was upheld. Playing the public attention for all it was worth, Hoover would fly to Miami to be cited in public as part of the search for the missing child. The details paint a different picture. The FBI had many suspects, all of which they lent on, but nothing came of it. In actuality, the hero of the day was local county sheriff D.C. Coleman. He would be the one to whittle down suspects to Franklin McCall and bring him to the FBI headquarters. McCall would be interrogated, tried, and eventually executed on February 24, 1939. Despite the little-known Florida lawman, J. Edgar Hoover's FBI would take all the credit in publicity, and therein, much public perception. Out of all the dark secrets of J. Edgar Hoover, there is none more surprising than his apparent suspicion of Albert Einstein. Yeah. Reportedly on Hoover's request, the FBI began keeping tabs on the famed physicist as early as 1932. At the time, Einstein and his wife Elsa had moved from Germany to the United States, predominantly off the back of Einstein's loud, outspoken stance on issues of nationalism and race. Curiously, Einstein was only ever anti-authoritarian and natural-born rebel. He was kicked out of German schooling at the age of 15, and even rejected his German citizenship at 17. Officialdom and kissing the ring was not Einstein's bag, and evidently, Hoover took notice. When Einstein would pass away in 1955, the FBI file kept on him would be nearly 1,500 pages in length. Ever the stalwart of institutions, Hoover overlooked all the man's contributions to society and found him overwhelmingly suspicious. Mm. In Hoover's eyes, a public figure willing to call segregation a disease of white people and militant nationalism as the measles of mankind was someone to be wary of. Einstein was an individual in the purest sense. He lived a life that respired and excelled on that very energy. Hoover likely couldn't comprehend this. 
Then again, his declaration that all intellectuals should refuse to testify in the 1950s anti-communist congressional hearings probably did him no favors. Bit of a hard ass from hard times, or not the greatest of guys? You decide. This is History on Fleek, and we'll see you next time.